and welcome back to Think Tech. And this is, uh, of course, this is uh, why this Hanukkah is different from all others under our series called How the World is Changing and why Hanukkah may never be the same with Rabbi Ishel Krasnjanski of Chabad of Hawaii. Welcome to the show, Rabbi. Thank you, Jay. As always, it's a pleasure to be here. The war in Israel and the anti-Semitic protests here in the U.S. are having an effect on the meaning and celebration of Hanukkah, it seems to me, because it's happening. It happened a few days ago. It's, it's very fresh. Um, Rabbi, we'd like you to help us understand what the effect is here and in Israel, the effect of the war uh, at this time of year, the Hanukkah time, and whether it is something that will be remembered this moment in history. Uh, going forward. So can you help us understand what Hanukkah is and what lessons and parallels we can draw between Hanukkah and where we are in this Hamas war? Sure. Actually, the similarities are very striking, and that does make this Hanukkah different than uh, last year's and the years before. Um, just for a little history, Hanukkah uh, celebrates and commemorates a military victory on the part of the Jewish people during the Second Temple era, over 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, when they were uh, attacked by the uh, Assyrian army, which is the Greek Assyrian army, who wanted to Hellenize. Uh, that's a term that they use to Hellenize the Jewish people and to absorb them into the Greek culture. Um, the the um, the prejudice and the and the oppression that the Jewish people suffered then, interestingly, was is very different than the oppression and the uh, terrible uh, attack that Israel suffered today, this year, on October 7th. The Greeks were not, did not want to destroy, annihilate the Jewish people. They actually saw in the Jewish people something very, very favorable that they wanted to absorb into their culture. But what they wanted was for the Jewish people to... Um, buy into the Greek culture. The problem is that the, the Jewish culture is really uh, diametrically opposed to the Greek culture. So it was a clash of cultures. How was it different? The Greek culture uh, uh, deifies uh, the human being, man, as the apex of creation. First of all, logic and reason and philosophy that was seen as the highest that man can aspire to right aristotle and all the other uh, philosophies that came out of that uh, culture uh, also the physical prowess hercules strong and fit uh, that was you know that was the aspiration the jewish people actually um while was recognized that they were very, very intelligent people. We are very intelligent people, very wise people. But at the heart of our belief is a total surrender to God, which is higher than reason. So reason is not the highest level. The highest level is actually beyond reason, to go to accept and to embrace something that go, that's beyond reason. The emphasis is on the spiritual, not on the physical. So to the Greeks, this was really uh, very opposed to their core beliefs. So the battle was an ideological battle, which spilled over into an actual war. The, the Greeks were very, very happy and, uh, and agreeable for the Jewish people to continue uh, practicing uh, Judaism, the Torah, but in a different way, basically to take God out of the picture and, and just embrace all the other wise teachings 
that we are found we are, we are, that are found in the Torah. The, the 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 terms that the sages use is that the Greeks came, and they defiled the oil. They did eat the oil that was necessary to burn uh, in the temple to light the menorah. It, does, it doesn't say they destroyed the oil, but they defiled the purity of the oil, which means they wanted to inject and for the Jewish people to accept the Greek uh, value and the Greek uh, belief systems and, 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 and have and have the oil. The oil is a symbol of light, a symbol of wisdom. They want to inject their values into the Jewish wisdom of thinking. And our sages recognize that, um, that, 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 that purity, so to speak, is really what sets the Jewish people apart from the other nations. So that was the problem that the Greeks had with the Jews. Hitler, going uh, closer to our generation, he didn't like any Jew, not their philosophy, not their being. He wanted to annihilate man, woman, and child and to just rid the world of the Jewish people. This is Hamas today. Hamas is the current day Nazi. It's not that they have a problem with the ideology of the Jewish people and their belief system. They have a problem with the Jew and the Jewish people. And it's not just a problem of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. It's the Jewish people all over the world, as they say themselves, that they want to start in Israel, but then, but then uh, march on and take over the entire world. So in that sense, it's different, but it's the same idea that there's a battle here, there's a war, um, and uh, it could be said that this is the war between what's moral and what's and between light and darkness. And this is an age old battle throughout civilizations. And, and it's a battle within each and every one of us. So um, what does Hanukkah celebrate? Hanukkah celebrates a miracle. The miracle was that against all odds, the Jewish people prevailed and they preserved their culture and they were able to rededicate the temple. It was against all odds. First of all, in numbers wise, the Greek uh, Syrian army were much, much, much greater in number, and they were a trained army. The Jewish people were not. But nevertheless, we were victorious on the battlefield, and we were victorious uh, in terms of the spiritual victory of retaining the pure oil. So, in this way, Hanukkah this year has a very resonates very very deeply because what is the definition of a miracle? When we and why do we celebrate miracles? So God created the world, and you have the natural order of things. The natural order of things is just systems that God put into this world. And when something happened that defies the, the natural order or that supersedes the natural order, it's a clear uh, expression or manifestation of God stepping in and uh, fixing or doing what has to be done in order to make things right. So this is an expression of love from God to whomever the miracle occurs. And when a person experiences a miracle in their life, it's basically that person feels a, an overwhelming feeling of gratitude to the one who performed the miracle for them. And only God can perform miracles. The story of Hanukkah is a national miracle that happened to all the Jewish people. So Hanukkah actually celebrates God's love for the Jewish people. And that's why Hanukkah is perhaps one of the most celebrated of Jewish holidays uh, throughout the calendar. We have many holidays, but Hanukkah strikes a very deep chord uh, through all, through the whole Jewish community, whether you're more religious or less religious, Hanukkah is a very, very special time. So, can, you talk, it, can you talk about the oil? Can you sure. talk about the miracle of the oil? So the, the full story is that um, the Greeks came into the temple, they uh, defiled the oil by touching it and, and, and purifying it. And it, it was the practice in the temple 
to light the menorah, that, which is the candelabra, every single afternoon. So there was a dilemma because there was no uh, um, pure oil with which to light the menorah because all the oil that was in the storage houses was defiled by the Greeks. And it would take a total of eight days for them to replenish the oil and make and make new pure oil because they have to follow a certain procedure. Uh, but they searched and they searched and they only found one jug of oil, enough to burn for one night. And that's the story in the miracle of Hanukkah that they poured this jug of oil into the menorah. And uh, even though it was only enough to last for one night, it, lasts for eight, it lasted for eight days until they were able to uh, replenish it with pure oil. So that's why we celebrate Hanukkah for eight days. That's the miracle of, of the lights. The oil represents, like we said before, uh, the intellect, wisdom, and the pure oil. Um, it represents the purity of, of of the ideology of the philosophy of the Jewish people, and in that way, the the miracle was an affirmation of God's love for the Jewish people. And the reason why I I, I think that's so important is because today, Jewish people in America, surely outside of America, are not feeling safe, or feeling threatened because of uh, the anti-Semitic uh, uh, call, the call, you know, the calls from the anti-Semites, you know, for Israel to be destroyed, for to support Hamas, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, now it's very almost like understandable for Jews to fear, to feel, uh, to be afraid, and to feel very, very uh, uncomfortable. So we have to remember that the celebration of Hanukkah we have to remember this celebration of Hanukkah rep- it demonstrates God's love for the Jewish people. And well, yeah. just as um, there was a miracle in Hanukkah, and people have never forgotten that for hundreds, even thousands of years, um, this, this war uh, where Israel is defending itself against terrorists who are sworn to destroy it, is also memorable, and I and I suggest to you that um, this war and this Hanukkah and this challenge will be remembered just as the original Hanukkah was remembered is remembered. What do you think? Yeah, I think uh, yeah, I think it's definitely the case, especially if, if you watch closely uh, what's going on. You see. And you read what's happening, what's coming out of uh, of Israel. You see open and revealed miracles. The soldiers on the front lines are sharing uh, stories of open and revealed miracles. That um, I'll tell you one that I just heard recently, and I heard it from uh, a talk from uh, a general in the Israeli army, and um, he and a group of of, of soldiers uh, were in in Gaza. No, not in Gaza. They were um, on the border, on the, on the southern border, immediately after a you know, massacre. And uh, they got there. And um, shortly afterwards, uh, there was, uh, they were ambushed by many, many uh, Palestinians. And there was like a battle ensued. And they were outnumbered. And After a little while, they ran out of bullets, they ran out of ammunition to defend themselves. And there was a couple of people there, I forget how many he said, and they all felt that the the end was very near for all of them. And um, one of the uh, members of this platoon or this brigade said to his friend that if God provides a miracle, and they come out alive. So he took it upon himself to observe the Sabbath. He was a very secular Israeli Jew that never observed the Sabbath or any of the Jewish rituals. But he felt at that moment that if God would save him, he would come back to his his religion and observe the Sabbath. And the person who was telling the story said, 
that he knows that this fellow was very far away from, from religious practice. Uh, he was Jewish, he was born Jewish, he was proud to be Jewish, he was proud to be an Israeli, but he never really practiced Judaism. And he was shocked to hear this from his friend. But the, the story was that he said within minutes, friends saying that, all of a sudden it got quiet. There was no more shooting. And they, and, and they heard these, these, the, the, the terrorists like just receding and, and, and going away. And after a while, they crawled out, they walked out, and no one was there, and they escaped, and they survived. Till today, he said, you know, there's no other way for him to explain what happened other than this was a miracle. And, and there's countless stories like this that are coming out that they, they're, they're experiencing a great miracle in Israel. Uh, you know, is being, um, Israel's being uh, forced to fight a battle under impossible uh, circumstances because they embed themselves among civilians, which forces them to, to fight it in a very dangerous way, you know, up front and close, which is very, very dangerous. Um, there were thousands and thousands of rockets that, were, that, were, um, that flew into Israel since October 7th. The, the amount of damage that it, it inflicted, the amount of casualties that is caused is so minuscule that there's no other way to explain it other than God's protecting the Jewish people. We see that one rocket that, that the terrorists lodged into Israel that didn't make it over the border and landed in a parking lot of a hospital killed 500 people or, four, or whatever, the, whatever the real number is, but it was a lot of people. Can you imagine if, if you know, all of these missiles flying into Israel, how many, potentially how many casualties there could be. And thank God, um, there's this God's protection. So this is really what Hanukkah celebrates. So to experience it in real time today, I think is a, is a, is a very, very uh, amazing thing. That's memorable. And in fact, it leads to the next question I was going to ask you, Rabbi. So as you said, uh, Israel is in large part a secular state. Um, there are Jews that don't practice. Um, the army uh, is uh, is a civilian army, and in large part, it's a secular army. Um, and yet, uh, they are, you know, in harm's way. Those young men, they're and women, they're late teens, early twenties, uh, most of them, um, and they they had to leave their jobs, their families, their their occupation, their lives in order to come and do this. I've been doing it for 65 days. And uh, it's, you know, it's troubling at the least uh, that, that they would come and have to put themselves in harm's way. But they do. And I keep thinking of some of the photographs I've seen of the Israeli soldiers uh, waking up and doing tefillin, you know, praying in the morning. And... Uh, I think it's probably an extension of the story that you told, how a, a very secular Jew can find religion that he didn't find before, or she, and that it brings them together, it makes them strong or stronger as an army. Um, am I right? Well, yes, I think you touch upon a very, very important point. So first of all, the truth is, and this is really at the core of the Chabad philosophy that the Rebbe taught us is, the truth is there's no such thing as a secular Jew. Every Jew, uh, because of the soul that we possess and the Shema that we possess, every single Jew, whether more conscious or less conscious, is very connected to God, very connected to everything that's good and beautiful uh, in this world. You know, one of the things that we see, if you look, if you bother to look objectively, the contrast between these young Israeli, so these soldiers, that are, like you say, they're, they're young kids, they're college age kids, some a little younger, some a little older, and the terrorists on the other side. We're hearing things that is just boggles the mind how these young Israeli soldiers can rise to such uh, moral heights and such moral strength 
that you wonder where is this coming from? Where is this depth of, of, of holiness coming from? This young kid wrote a letter, and sadly he was killed, uh, but they found what he wrote. Basically, he writes that um, if he should die or if he should be captured, he doesn't want for anyone to negotiate on his behalf and to offer up some the release of these of some of these terror, terrorists from jail, he doesn't want uh, for them to for this for the Israeli army to to go, come into harm's way and put themselves in danger to save him. You know his 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 you know his ultimate aim was to protect the Jewish people, and if it's meant for him to die, he would die. I mean we're. How does a 21-year-old, a 22, a 25-year-old young man or woman ha have such such noble feelings and, and, and sacrifice? I mean, it's like unbelievable. And you contrast that with the with the murderous uh, aspirations of the terrorists. Just they just want to murder and kill and inflict uh, as much pain and harm. On innocent people, the contrast is just beyond anything that, uh, and that that's what makes it all the more um, uh, maddening and frightening when you so many people um, are out there supporting Hamas. Yeah, it, it really is. Uh, it's hard to believe. I, and I remember a comment made. I'm, I'm so impressed by the Israelis who are. Um, on YouTube, and uh, anyone wants to see them, you can see them all day. There's, there's one fellow, his name is Levy, uh, who is probably the most incredible commentator, and he has the facts, he has the figures, he answers questions, whatever questions are put to him, and he gives you an accurate statement. He, you know, there's a lot of misreporting going on, and there's a lot of, you know, stress on the, you know, the, um, the uh, humanitarian aspect of what what is happening um, to the uh, uh, Palestinians, which I think is, you know, it's misreported. Um, but this this fellow is very accurate and very matter of fact. And, you know, you he's every day he, he reports and I have come to watch him every day. What I, but what I have seen in the people who report from Israel is that they are morally strong. They are factual and honest the extent they can be, um, and they are impressive in their, what do you want to call it, level of civil society. They represent the civil society of Israel, a democracy, and through them you can see that. Anyway, one, one of these uh, reporters, I mean, from the Israel government, a, a spokesman, was asked, why, why do you continue to fight? And he said, and I, you know, I just sat back. I, I was struck by his answer. It's because we have to. We have no choice. This is defending our nation from obliteration. We have no choice but to fight. There's only one thing we can do. That's what we must do. We must defend ourselves because the alternative is so completely disastrous. And I don't think the, the kids on the American college campuses understand that at all. But I think I think those those kids uh, who are in the Israeli army, IDF, they understand it. They're defending their nation, their people, their religion. They're they're defending their 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 moral um, suasion, and um, and that's why they're so strong, individually and as an army. I, at first, I was wondering. Um, you know, what do, what do these kids think? They're in harm's way. They could be shot and killed any moment. But they're strong enough to deal with that. They go out there on the battlefield, and they deal with it, and they are not afraid. They understand, and they are committed. That's what I see. That's me. And I think I'm, we're touching each other on, on that very point with those, those kids. You so, know, just to, just to, sorry, just to contrast... You know this war, the war that Putin is uh, is leading in Russia. So when when the Russian government came out with uh, to conscript 
all young men from such and such an age that they have to show up and go fight in the army. So what I read is that hundreds of thousands of people, Russian young, young, young people, fled the country. They didn't want to fight a, an unjust war or whatever, you know, they, you know, they didn't want to fight. And Putin had to release prisoners from, 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 from jail and recruit them as fighters. When Israel came out and uh, with the, with the what they call Saf Shmona, which is uh, rule number eight, which is a, a, calling up all the reservists and calling everyone in, more pe more people s presented themselves to to come fight than than the Israeli army was was able to 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 take, and even till today. I know a, a friend of ours, the doctor here in Hawaii, and he sent to the channels in Israel, you know, he has 30 years of experience. He's a trauma specialist. He offered if he could help for them to let him know, and he would drop everything and he would fly over. There's tens and tens and hundreds and hundreds of people like, like that throughout the country and uh, throughout the world. Through. Yeah, and well, and there are a lot of young people, men and women in the United States who have gone over to Israel, presented themselves with one specialty or aspiration or another. They're not all accepted, um, but some are, and they're trained, and they're on the battlefield, and they enjoy that same motivation uh, that the Israeli young people have. It's It's very impressive, and it's memorable, and it's just another thing that makes this Hanukkah different. Yes, indeed. So, um, you know, we know we have challenges here. We have uh, challenges of people and students in the United States uh, protesting in favor of Hamas. There's an article in the paper yesterday about the Bronx. <laughs> I don't know if you saw this. The, the, the Bronx um, uh, public defender, uh, they're in favor of Hamas at the public defender because they're very, very super liberal and they're responding to, you know, the Palestinian call. Um, and, you know, we have various organizations. It's not just the students in, in the universities who are protesting in favor of Hamas. And then in the US, United Nations General Assembly, uh, they got it backward. And I really enjoy when uh, this spokesman, Levy, lets them have it in his daily reports. But, you know, other people from Israel go to the United Nations. And they by, by, the way, by the way, someone pointed out that the United Nations is never ever in in agreement about anything except when it comes to condemning Israel. All of a sudden, they're all in agreement. It's true. So and then you have, you know, you have, um, may I say, um, you have various um, Arab countries that are attacking Israel in every way they can. You have the entire, you know, Islamic establishment attacking Arab Israel in every way they can. Um, and you have, um, you have members of Congress uh, who are um, refusing to provide further aid to Israel and uh, putting pressure on Joe Biden, uh, who is responding to some extent um, to that pressure. So I wanted, to, I wanted to give you an opportunity, Rabbi, to speak to them, all of them, um, to the, the students who protest, to the General Assembly, that, uh, you know, is so so backward and, um, you know, unsupportive, and to the members of Congress who um, are interested in other much smaller and inconsequential political issues than supporting what Israel is trying to do to help itself, to defend itself. If I could give you a moment, Rabbi, to speak to them all, if they were all here watching the show, what would you say to them? I think I would say that um, you have to ask yourself a question. Are you a decent human being that uh, values life and respects uh, the rights for other people to live? Or, or is there some kind of dark, dark side to you that, that, uh, a lot, uh, that, uh, is okay with other people being uh, slaughtered and raped and suffer for no good reason. And this is what this fight is about currently in Israel. 
that the Hamas, uh, their charter and their and their aspirations are to kill many Jews as possible. This is what they did on October 7th in the most brutal way. And um, I would say to everyone that you, you know, you should really uh, uh, look and see what they did and see, and see in good conscience, can you support that? And by being uh, silent or worse, by saying that uh, maybe they're not, maybe they were justified, is is really giving aid to this evil force of the Hamas, and you're really part of it by uh, not protesting it. So that's what the battle is: it's between light and darkness. Hanukkah celebrates light. Are you part of the of light and the solution of, or of of good and and kindness? Or are you part of the evil force of darkness? Yeah, it's about human decency. And I'm reminded of um, some of these protests where if if a Jewish person or organization wants to participate in the conversation that takes place in and around the protests, um, they are yelled at, they are, they are shut down, they are threatened, sometimes they're beat, beat up. Um, and it's it's worse than just the, the people in the protest supporting Hamas and uh, shouting, uh, you know, from the river to the sea, let's eliminate Israel, is that they do not let the Jews or the people who would oppose that view even speak in the conversation. I, I find that even worse. Anyway, um, and I, I have to say that I did not like uh, what happened in Congress a few days ago where those uh, uh, university administrators uh, kept saying, well, it may or may, this, this kind of support of Hamas uh, and terrorism and killing Jews um, may or may not be uh, in violation of our rules against uh, harassment. Um, but it depends on the context. And I, and I said to myself, Rabbi, gee, I wish I was there because I have a few questions I would like to put to them. What do you mean by context? Uh, let's examine that. Anyway, um, it, was, it was really outrageous. So here we have kind of established that there is a, a parallel of sorts, a, um, you know, a connection um, between this Hanukkah now uh, and what is happening on the battlefield in Hamas and elsewhere, um, you know, at the borders of, of Israel. And um, we have uh, we found we found we found common points there between uh, Hanukkah and, uh, for that matter, Passover, <laughs> and of course. What's going on in, in the Gaza? Um, and so it, it's likewise, it's unprecedented. And um, here you're a rabbi for a lifetime. Uh, you travel hither and yon. You talk to Jewish people hither and yon uh, in person or by, by, by media. And uh, you think about this all day long because, you know, you're, you're charged especially with preserving the culture, the religion, the connection, um, you know, with, with the Jewish God. And um, I wonder how you feel. I never asked you this before. How do you feel about this personally? Uh, it's, it's unprecedented. It's shocking. How concerned are you for Israel, for the Jewish people, uh, for the Jewish people all over the world, for Chabad? Not only Chabad of Hawaii, but Chabad globally. Uh, and for the Jewish clergy, the rabbis like yourself, how do you feel? Um, I don't think it's just as a rabbi, I, can, I, I could say this, but I think any, any person, surely any Jewish person that has studied or knows Jewish history, that the Jewish people are an eternal people. This, this, this problem is anti-Semitism, the, the, the pogroms and the slaughter unfortunately has been with us for a very, very long time, from the beginnings of time. And uh, we, the Jewish people, have survived uh, all throughout in a miraculous way. Ben-Gurion once said, any Jew that doesn't believe in miracles is not a realist. The reality of our existence is 
that we are an eternal people because we're connected to the eternal God. And the land of Israel is God's uh, gift to the Jewish people. So it's the eternal land of the Jewish people. Nothing will change that. Uh, not, not the United Nations approval or disapproval or the Hamas's uh, attempts or any other anti-Semite. Or, or we will be victorious. There's no doubt about it. We only pray to God that uh, it, it happens with, with as few uh, fallen soldiers as possible and that it happens as quickly as possible. But there's no doubt about that. So while it's very um, disconcerting, the anti-Semitism, especially here in America, for us American Jews, which, which thank God we didn't have to, you know, we haven't felt anti-Semitism, uh, you know, for a very, very long time. And that's why this country is really a blessed country for the Jewish people. Um, to be honest with you, um, it doesn't throw into question, you know, whether we could survive this or whether we're going to be able to overcome this. We definitely will, as we've done time and time again, because, uh, because, like I said, as long as we're connected to God, the eternal God, we well, we are the eternal people. Yeah, and um, you mentioned before we began the show that Steven Spielberg, who uh, who did um, Schindler's List, which is a really remarkable piece of filmmaking, um, and has the Shoah Project, um, which is about the Holocaust, uh, where, where he interviews the survivors of the Holocaust to memorialize their testimony and what happened to them and others. But now he's doing another project. Um, and guess what? It's about the massacre of October 7th. Can you talk about it? Well, I just heard it like yourself. I know that he announced uh, the last couple of days that he's going to put together uh, uh, the exact same uh program that he had that collecting uh, interviews from survivors of the Holocaust. He's going to do this for those who survived the October 7th massacre and those who were eyewitnesses, etc., for the world to, to see and to record the atrocities that happened uh, on October 7th. We need him to do that. We need him to do that. We need uh, YouTube, which provides a remarkable community service. Uh, of uh, allowing people to post uh, their testimonies about what's going on and what did go on on October 7th. And there's a wealth of information actually on YouTube. And one of the things that I watched, I, I can't believe how how valuable the reporting is on YouTube. It's much more, much more factual, much more, much better reporting than you see on cable or, or even uh, the print press. But um, what I what I wanted to mention is uh, is the movie that is now, uh, I guess it's on it's on Netflix um, and or Prime, uh, and especially it's on YouTube for free. And it's called uh, Golda. It's the story yes. of the 1973 war uh, where uh, Israel was attacked from multiple sides, and it was a surprise attack in the same way they didn't see it coming. Uh, they didn't respond uh, as quickly as they should have. Um, it's the one that Moshe Dayan was involved in, and and Golda Meir saw how how upset he was, how self critical he was about what happened, and she supported him. And at the table, the strategic table in the prime minister's office, there she was as caring as any Jewish mother would have been. And this is a very interesting movie, and it is again a parallel. And to what is happening today, I, I hope I hope everyone gets a chance to see that movie. Closing comments, Rabbi. This is uh, one of the last show, the last show we're going to produce this year. So I wonder if you have any remarks you'd like to leave with our viewing audience. Yeah, sure. And that is as a Jew and uh, for the Jewish community here, as well as throughout the country, or whoever gets to see this, it's important to. Um, to, to know that what, what's the blessing of being Jewish is the positive things of being Jewish. Our uh, deep connection to God, uh, all the good that the Jewish people do throughout the world. And uh, that's really our identity. The fact that there is anti-Semitism around the world 
uh, should not shape our identity, should not be the uh, influencing factor in how we live our lives. We should, we should, we should learn and explore the positive the beauty of being Jewish, and then we will feel less frightened by what's happening around us. Thank you, Rabbi. The, the phrase keeps bouncing around in my head, but I don't remember the translation, and it goes this way, Am Yisrael Chai, Chai. Uh, Am Yisrael Chai, what does that mean? Yeah, it means uh, the Jewish nation lives. Thank you. overcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Rabbi Itchel Krasnjanski, uh, here on ThinkTech, and we really appreciate you coming on. Uh, Thank every you, Jay. Time. It's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Good luck. Aloha. Shalom. Well.